This is a picture of something called a boy. People who've studied boys in action, or in their rare moments of inaction, will tell you that we know practically nothing about boys. Maybe they're right, but some things we do know, or think we know, or at least we think we are beginning to know. Anyway, we've been looking at a lot of boys lately, and here are some of our observations. Only last winter we discovered that even when the temperature is way down around zero, you don't have to look for boys. All you have to do is listen. Obviously, every normal boy believes that winter was invented for his special benefit and entertainment. Not just cold weather, but real winter with snow. This well-known white stuff, a prime nuisance to most adults, seems to have a curious effect on a boy's already active imagination. Familiar fields become trackless wastes, which must be explored. This is no ordinary Arctic expedition. What other group can start after lunch, travel all the way to the North Pole, and still get home in time for supper? Eventually, of course, winter outstays its welcome. Boys suddenly become disenchanted with ice and snow. In fact, they can hardly wait for summer. And summer always comes with long, lazy days, with bright, hot sun and deep, cool shade. Truly, summertime is boy time. For instance, a boy on a baseball field has the look of a creature who has fulfilled his destiny. Not all boys play baseball well, but all of them look as if they do. That is because they wisely ignore the narrower motives of the game, such as hitting the ball or catching it, and concentrate on the essential spirit of the thing. Thus, no right-minded boy would think of approaching the batter's box without assuming a stance like that of his current big league hero. And no youthful pitcher would dream of delivering the ball before shooting a crafty and menacing glance at the runner on first base. Boys have a natural insight into the soul of the machine. They know that the normal state of any mechanical device is out of order. Consequently, a boy's first impulse with any mechanism is to find out what is or soon will be wrong with it. Unfortunately, the machine in its cunning sometimes lets itself be repaired, and the false confidence which boys get as a result makes them easy victims for the rest of their lives. It is no rare sight to find a man pretending to understand a car salesman's explanation of a motor, or even buying the car, rather than admit he doesn't know what compression ratio means. This is what comes of being clever about machinery. Until they are corrupted by adult guidance, boys approach raw materials in the spirit of pure craftsmanship. This consists of making, with infinite patience, something of no use at all. A boy left alone in a situation like this soon discovers that the essence of woodworking is to take a board and reduce it to a pile of shavings. And this knowledge can remain a source of happiness to him all his life. If women only realized this, they might think twice about pestering their husbands to fix the screen doors, 
when they could be making, with an investment of only $500 in power tools, a table that cannot be bought for less than $12 in any store. Boys and dogs hold similar views on most subjects. They agree on the importance of taking a shortcut even when it means going a mile or two out of their way. Both are serious collectors and, in addition, share a remarkable instinct which leads them to just the right type of place for finding valuable items. They rarely return from a trip without an old carburetor, half of a boot, 21 inches of a six-foot rule, or a sign marked, uh, no trespassing. Some observers believe that the dog is an early form of boy. Whether or not this is so, it is certain that boys and dogs recognize each other's soundness and can get along with less jabber than any other two creatures in the world. Bicycles, like dogs, seem to have a curious affinity for boys. All well-trained bikes will submit without protest to the periodical maintenance that boys think they need. Mostly, this takes the form of checking the air in the bike's tires. About five or six times a day is considered standard practice. Especially when brand new, a bike expects to be treated as a member of the family. If banished from the living room, a bike is likely to get temperamental and hide in the shrubbery, pretending to be lost. Few parents can face more than one such emergency. About as soon as boys are old enough to be allowed out of sight of the kitchen window, they tend to go fishing. Perhaps what seems to be a harmless pastime is really a form of the fishing fever that infects their elders several times a year. Maybe it's the other way around, and a habit established in boyhood persists into adult life. Whichever way it works, one thing is apparent. The biggest and sportiest fish on record have been caught by boys. Perch and sunnies commonly reach a weight of 30 or 40 pounds in the waters where boys fish, and the mild-mannered flounder fights more viciously than a tiger shark. It is no boy's fault that his catch will show an astonishing tendency to shrink while being carried home. Sometimes boys fish together, in groups of two or three. At other times, a boy will feel compelled to seek solitude, to go around the bend from the other fellows and whip the lonely reaches of some far-off river, to drop his special favorite worm in just the exact spot that will outwit the monster salmon or trout that lurks in the deepest e And if he doesn't hook the trout, or the salmon, or anything, it doesn't matter in the least. The important thing is, he has gone fishing. About once a day, a boy suddenly begins to act as if he's just been reading one of the more poisonous philosophers. He sees through everything. He hates everybody. Anything you say or fail to say is wrong. In dealing with a boy in this condition, the impulse to throw him away should be resisted. Instead, he should be fed. This will restore his optimism for 24 hours. Do not, however, make the mistake of telling him he's just hungry. 
especially after the boy has reached maturity. If there is anything a man hates, it is to be told while cruising along nicely on a dim view or right in the middle of a sad epigram that he is just hungry. As long as they are not encouraged to do so, boys have no objection to reading books and soon develop a gluttony for the printed word. They soak up print with their eyes, ears, mouths, and pores. They also have the gift of partial recall, which accounts for the slightly unsettling quality of their conversation. Once a boy has learned to read, his parents must be prepared at all times for such exclamations as, drop the portcullis, men, my radar's jammed. And the dinner table remarks of a boy at this stage are likely to range from, uh, hey, this spaghetti is neat, to, uh, these fearless cookies have an unpleasant aftertaste. There's not a thing that can be done about it. So what is a boy? What makes a boy? It seems nobody knows completely. It must be some inner thing that can't be analyzed by ordinary logical methods. All we know is we're in favor of boys because boys of all living creatures live in the happiest time. In a special golden age of their own making, a golden age that ends every night and renews itself every morning. A golden age in which today is forever. Yesterday was swell, and tomorrow will surely be super. Those of us who've been around a while might say that boys are in for some surprises. But boys living in their own happy time have a most annoying habit of not paying the least bit of attention to the pessimistic predictions of the older generation. And the world is better for it. A boy's confidence is most reassuring to his elders, who find in a small, hot, sunlit face some reason to believe that civilization still has a few years to go.